to take command and lose control. It's a line from a uh, Hilt Spill song. The title of the show is a line from Hilt Spill song. If you don't know that band, they've got really good lyrics. Um, but uh, take command and lose control. And so I just kept like, saying, all right, just it's fine. Let it go nuts. Let it go nuts. I had incredible anxiety before you guys got here. Because I allowed, like, I was like, all right, we're going to get cookie dudes. Like, I was like, I'm going to put jars of water up there. You know, so um, I'm glad it worked out. Uh, <laughs> on to this one. Um, and I probably left a lot of stuff off there. If anybody's interested in any other part of it, please ask. Um, so this, I was, I got a grant from the um, Porter Fleming Foundation, which is incredibly, like, I can't tell you how good that felt to not have a middleman to ask for some money to do something and somebody to say, all right, here. Okay? Uh, I wrote a grant, my first grant I ever wrote. Uh, I asked for some money, they gave me some money, I made a painting. It started out as it was going to be history. I was going to put timelines of Augusta in here with the artist in the back. Just a little, just a little shadow of what was happening in the creative community. I went to the Morris Museum, they were incredibly helpful. Um, I can't remember the librarian's name, I think it's Kiri. It's Kiri. That guy is awesome and uh, helped me find out what I needed to know or, or where to look. And so what I did was I started to go back. Um, first off, I could not include all the artists. There's amazing artists in this town that I could not include in this painting because of space. And that's, uh, I, I listened to Pete Colkey talk one time about using purples for shadows and walked outside and looked at the shadow of a tree and saw purple. She changed the way that I saw the world. So like there's people that I wish I could have included that I couldn't. And there's people, well, anyway. So I started with the West Indians. And the West Indians built fish wares, which as a kid I thought were essentially like industrious, Kids of the 70s build the rock dams. These are seen, can be seen from Google Earth. They're gigantic bees that not only uh, point to why Augusta is here, which is the, is the on the fall line, that's the shoals, right? the last part of the Savannah River. Um, they also, aesthetically, they look like Robert Smith's and Spiral Jetty. They look like these things that, as water levels rise and fall, they change. And I recognize them. And I don't know if this is accurate, but as probably the oldest man-made structure around here. And they, aesthetically, they're very, very interesting. Walk across them and you'll get a feel for it. So um, I have these Indians building this fish here. And you would think that like, if you don't know what someone looks like, that you have carte blanche to make them any way that you want. The problem is, is that if you don't know what anybody looks like, which is this, this over, you have to make it up. And it's like, it's... The equivalent of doing all the sound for like a computer animated movie, I imagine. Like you have to make up everything. I have no idea of like what any of these people, so they're composites of things. So the Indians were done, I knew I wanted to do them. And then we moved to a Victorian era painter, which is a composite of a few of my friends and a few of the people. Um, you know, I got my wife to take a photograph of me and then I used that as a basic outline. I had him rendering or starting to render what would be the person who found North Augusta. That's to pay homage to where I grew up. Um, and then we moved down and we have Dave the Potter. Okay, Dave, if you don't know, worked in Edgefield County. He was a slave who learned how to read and write. Okay, and so we know about him because he was able to sign his pots. Okay, so I put some books down here and that led me into what I could research better. Not a whole lot of information here. So here we get to the First, Augusta Art Club. That's where it's Folly, the building we're in right now. Okay? Um, basically, we had an art season. People would make, the artists would make work in the summertime. And in the wintertime, snowbirds would come down from north and they would have all these art shows and sell art. It's like I, I, I couldn't stop myself while I was painting. It's like, imagine an art season. Like, what if the last day of like this, like started the art season and like boom, all these shows started happening in all these different places and stuff. And we have festivals that do that. Um, but like on, like a, on a whole, like, anyway. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I did this and I dropped down to the first executive director of Gertrude Herbert, a guy named Horst Talmadge Day. Never heard of him before. Born in rural China. Came here, learned 
that yeah. rural China and the rural South were a lot alike and really fell in love with the place and um, basically started the Gertrude Harbor on its way. Okay? This place has seen a lot. Like, the reason the clouds are stylized like this here is this is Green Schoolcraft. He hung Maxfield Parish's first show in the South here. So the first time the Maxfield Parish ever had a show in the South, it was in the Gertrude Herbert, which is an interesting, you know, an interesting thing. And then you start finding out, like, Marie Cassatt, like, all these other, you know, people coming through here, like, it has a really interesting heritage. Um, the truck is of the year that Morris Talmadge Day started. Uh, so that was kind of a little parallel there. This is where I start to understand more what's going on. And I knew a little bit. And it was less research and more of remembering the stories I heard. Um, and so what it starts to be is it starts to be these attachments and relationships. And very Fleming, uh, I put it with his fist balled up intentionally on a book called Colonel Effingham's Raid. Hollywood picked it up, made it into a movie. It dismantled the Cracker Party. You can imagine what the Cracker Party was, OK? That book and that movie did away with that, like straight up took them out, right? So like that, to me, is like that's the kind of work I, I would like to make. I would love to make something that has an impact like that. Now, this is a painting of his in the background, OK? Like truly the Renaissance man. This painting, uh, when I was reading the book about him, um, uh, Ed Rice did the description of it and mentioned that this is the easel in his studio. All right, Ed Rice, um, and I, Ed, Ed knows better than I do, but I hope I don't mess anything up. But uh, uh, Ed saw Freedom Schoolcraft as a mentor. He moved here from Chicago. He was an artist. Like, he made a living making art. And I think that, um, to, to read some of the things that Ed said, it made him realize that is a legitimate path. And so, you have these two guys shoulder to shoulder, um, which brings you down here. Which, I have to say, I really wish I would have, uh, I, well, I started out saying I was not going to just rep, like, paint other people's work. I was like, I'm not going to paint other people's work. I'll do, like, works in progress and things like that. When I got to Ed's, like, I tried to pencil them out. And then um, I, I started finding myself like exploring. And then I was like, oh my god, I have to stylize these because I cannot do what he does. <laughs> so like, there was a real, I started to get really self-conscious of it, um, especially with him looking at me the entire time. <laughs> um, but I hope he, I hope I, yeah, hope I, This is where I almost lost control of it. Um, when I started doing Mr. Morris Burger, I started having so much fun. Like, honestly, I read his book, I've seen the, the movie on him that the Morris made. Like, when I grow up, I want to be like him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I got joy out of painting like him, just as a mocking verse, okay? Um, moving paint around and finding things. You know, the, the, the hats, and the, the fish, and the dog, and the... Like, all of this stuff, I know what it means, um, and it meant something to me to represent it. Um, these two guys, like, for me, are role models not only on how to present my work and how to take it seriously, but how to act like a man, like a gentleman. You know what I mean? And I try, don't always succeed, but I try. Um, right, that's enough of that. Uh, Kathy Engler, I never got a chance to meet her. I was familiar with her work. I think everybody's familiar with her work. Um, I, I really, like the more I dug, the more I really liked her work. Uh, I regret not being able to you know, meet her. Um, I hope I represented her well, if anyone. You know. um, these, this little area right here is very important to me. This is where I kind of come into the picture. Uh, I've known Raul Pacheco and, since the 80s. And I wish I could put my old and Shashir in there, but that's just too much beer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, Raul and I met in the 80s, and I've had a relationship with him that has always been built off of mutual respect and like eagerness to see what they're doing. And so what I did was I took the dog, uh, Mr. Morrisburg's dog, and I put him next to it. The connectivity there is not unintentional. I, at the time, was in the soul bar with, all, with a lot of other 
you other guys, right? And you know, we were all trying to learn how to make art. The thing is, is that um, there were a few of them that were taking classes with Mr. Morrisberger, and then when you start seeing the work they're making, you realize that something's missing in yours. And so I basically became a scavenger, and I would pick up anything that they were doing if there was something rounded in the corner, and I saw how that moved, made, made me move to the painting, I started doing that. Um, so I feel like I might have gotten an indirect education from Mr. Morrisburg at ASU uh, without having to pay for it. Um, and some representations of some of Roll's uh, work recently. Um, I put the soul bar on there because in, in my telling of this story, and this is my version, um, in my telling of this story, it always has a because I would not, I would have to hang on back of painting. If, uh, if, if it was not for the soul bar, a lot of us would have never had a first show. I bought my first piece of art in soul, soul bar. I had my first show in the soul bar. I had like a lot of the stuff that happened to me in early like developmental stuff all came out of that place. And relationships that like I, I still have. All right, so now we move to something uh, Recognizable person here, <laughs> Litter. All right, I love him. All right, and not that I don't love everybody else on here, but like I have a fondness for him because he wears his heart on his sleeve, and what he does, he does legitimately out of passion. And so this wing nut, when I asked people to pose, got up on his tiptoes with a paintbrush. So I'm like, all right, so I guess I'm going to have to paint like a nine-foot robot or something. For, you know, because, and so what I ended up doing was putting him on the robot head, the square robot head. And that allowed him to get himself up and afforded him the opportunity to remember and recognize. And if you don't know like, the story, you should watch the documentary because it's a beautiful movie. Um, the thing that that did is, in him making himself happy, he made everybody around him happy, and he started to change his landscape. This is just like Barry Fleming. You know, this is just like the West of Indians. This is just like these people, okay? Um, then we go to Jennifer Onofrio. All right, I, I haven't known Jennifer as long, but I've known her work for a long time. Her work is, it's deliberate, it's beautiful, and it's like, and, and it's the stuff that I'm like, oh, that, that's, supposed to, that's supposed to be a gallery. That's supposed to be a white, wall, a white gallery. You know what I mean? It's supposed to be this. And talking with her about these shapes, and these, they're, they're, they're based on stupas and their vessels. They have this feminine quality to it, but she showed up to the, to the shoot to take pictures with like painter's tape around her fingers. So it's like feminine. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I, I just, I dig her work. I dig the way she expressed herself. Um, Swider put on a show that had a, a lot of artists working in sequence, and she made something that like was very impactful to me. Like at that, at that point, I recognized, oh my, that's something else, you know. And like I, I really wanted to include her. Um, Baruti, Baruti, like you know what he does. I, the first time I saw him was at. Um, uh, it was a live painting event, and he was painting with his fingers, and I, I walked by, and I made that mistake of saying, like, that's a gimmick. Then I saw his paintings, and I was like, that's not a gimmick. You know, the level of detail that he's able to achieve, the, like the tactile, you know, it's, there's something, man, there's something really earthy about it. And the, the thing is, is that, like, Jennifer's a professor at the college, Baruti, is, is doing the same thing. Uh, he started a place called Humanity House with his wife, and that's uh, hence the tree. And what he's doing is he's using that as this Algonquin esque place where people can get together and like you know, share ideas and foster the next generation of what's happening. So we got through this, and I'm like, all right, I'm at the end of the painting. I, I, by the way, the studio is only big enough to have three on the easel at the same time, so I didn't see it until it went up. An exercise in faith. <laughs> um, so I've got these three up and these two over here, and I'm trying to imagine how it's all going to work together. And I've got this area right here, and I don't know what to put in there. And so um, I start looking at the reason that these two went here is because of the way that this works. You know, it brings your eye around all of this. I wanted that to round off the edge. 
Um, and looking at it, you have an African American man and you have a woman. And I looked down here and I didn't see one African American man. So what I ended up doing was, and you can recognize from my very rudimentary frames on the other ones, this is supposed to be a painting. And what it is, is it's made with the paint, leftover paint from the Jesse Norman School mural, the yellow in the background, and the blue butterflies. This is the butterfly coming out of Jesse Norman School. Okay? This is the next generation. I want there to be not only, you know, a woman of color making art in our community, I want there to be, like, dozens of women of color making art in our community, dozens of men of color, dozens of women, dozens of everybody, right? And the way that we do that is we start to introduce things like this, all right? And I'm not saying this is a solution or anything, but when my kid gets old enough to ask about Art and Augusta, I can point to something. It's reference material. It's saying, do you know who this is? This is Ed Rice, okay? Do you know who this is? This is Mr. Morrisburg. And this is my Mr. Morrisburg, by the way. This is, this is the first Morrisburg, Mr. Morrisburg I ever recognized. It's the inside out red sweatshirt with this paint on the shoulders. And I used to walk through the Morse Museum to the back of it because that big head that he had was in the back. And I would start there. And I, before I really recognized what any of this was, I recognized there was something about it that I liked. Um, I didn't know who Horst Talmadge Day was. I started looking at his work. I love his work. The idea that Barry Flynn could write a book and dismantle a political, political party, that's the kind of stuff that like, <laughs> needs to. Um, I don't know, be more discussed. Um, we can move on this way if you guys want to. I don't think it's all the way to